Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna start a new segment in addition to the other cases we follow, and this is gonna be called Solved by DNA. The first episode is episode one, the Kalitsky Bogle murders, and this comes out of Cascade County, Great Falls, Montana. This is gonna be one of the oldest cases that has been recently solved by DNA. So let's start off with the copyright disclaimer and then let's get into it. Here we have the sweethearts, Patricia J. Kalitsky, 16, and Lloyd Dwayne Bogle, age 18. Bogle was an airman from Waco, Texas, who was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, and the year was 1956. The 16-year-old blonde and the airman had been dating for several months. Lloyd had been a Christmas guest at the Kalitsky home. Patricia was 5'8 and 112 pounds, and she liked ballet and tap dance, and she went to the Great Falls High School. Her sister Darlene said, She always had a smile and those big blue eyes, deep blue, with eyelashes that you could hang a hat on. One of her friends said she was just a fun-loving kid. She was always giggling. I don't think she had a mean bone in her body. Many of the early articles note how she took a Dick Tracy comic book to the barber shop and on a wild whim asked to have her blonde hair cut into what they called Curly Lou. And I couldn't find Curly Lou, but this is what I think they meant. I think it was this Crewy Lou where she had almost like a, a, a buzz cut out on the top and then curly in the back, which kind of also matches the picture. But the, um, the haircut made a little bit of a splash in the town. So think it's right after Christmas holidays. Bogle stayed at the Kalitsky home. He's been dating the daughter. And then the couple go to a drive-in restaurant. And for you youngsters, drive-in restaurants were a thing. They were phasing out by the time I was born. But what you would do is you would drive your car in. You could order all kinds of food. They'd have like hops that came out to your car or you could pick it up at a, a station and then you sat in your car in front of a humongous screen with a bunch of other people in their cars and you watched a movie and then people would like make out in their cars and stuff it was a thing the couple were last seen by the drive-in restaurant attendants at nine o'clock on january 2nd and when they don't show back up at the kalitsky residence or at least pat didn't with the family think of this of this loving couple they thought they went off and eloped the family thought oh my gosh they went off and eloped so the family this is where they're coming from there was a lot of laughter in the house when Dwayne was around they were just so happy they were in love they're getting to know each other Pat had her mind set on college and they you know it's 10 o'clock that was their curfew and they were in a panic, but they just assumed that they had loped. And then the next day, the following day, three boys are on a hike and they stumbled upon a scene. They find a car parked in the lover's lane near the Great Falls Trap and Skeet Club. And this is in a park. And they find Bogle wearing civilian clothes. Here's a crime scene photo you can see the car you can see the passenger side door you can see Bogle almost um, under the car and in the background you can see the two of the three hikers the car was parked between two trees and again Lloyd was found beside him beside the car partially under it face down with his hands bound behind him with his own white suede belt he'd been shot execution style in the back of the head and robbery was not initially suspected because Lloyd still had $5 in his wallet, and this is $5 in 1956 money, and there was also an expensive camera found in the car. Here's an article from NPR last year, June 12, 2021. During a walk near the Sun River, they, the kids, found 18-year-old Lloyd Dwayne Bogle dead from a gunshot wound to the head, they found him on the ground near his car and someone had used his belt to tie his hands behind his back. At this point, no one knows where Patricia is. She's missing. So 
They're looking for her and they're very concerned. Since they can see that Bogle was shot execution style seemingly, they were extremely worried about Patricia. The officers said there was no evidence of a struggle and they theorized that the airman was killed by someone known to him because of the fact that there wasn't much of a struggle. But then again, there was a gun. So there you go. And then the following day, Patricia was discovered off a remote highway in Cascade County by a maintenance worker who was grading a road. She was found down a rocky ravine eight miles away from the first crime scene. She was found off, I think, what's known now as Vineyard Road. She was fully clothed, but the county coroner had the wherewithal to still take a vaginal swab. The police said they did not think robbery or even sex was the motive, but maybe that was because they wanted to keep that hold back information close to the chest, or maybe they just didn't assume that it was a motive because she was wearing her dress still. And in this photo, this is an autopsy photo, you can see the marks she sustained from the rocky ravine when she tumbled down the ravine. So the investigators take stock. You have one victim in a lover's lane, face down, hands tied behind his back, shot execution style behind his right ear. You then next day find the other victim fully clothed, also shot behind the right ear, seemingly with the same weapon, and she has been discarded without a car. So they're looking to find who did it. Back then they used to do what's called an inquest and the coroner's jury said, we the jury feel the gunshot wound that caused the death was fired by a person or persons unknown due to the similarity of circumstances, time and association of this death and the death of Lloyd Bogle, we feel an autopsy should be done to help complete the investigation and aid the prosecution. And also note it didn't look as if she had put up a struggle either, but then again there was a gun involved. So then they sought to compare the bullet wounds to the victims and the police assumed that they were both shot with a large caliber gun. Again, they were both shot in the same place, you know, behind the right ear, seemingly well on their knees. And so then they tried to collect all the evidence to see if there were any other gunshots. So let's talk about evidence collection in the 50s compared to 2020. We, we have all kinds of technology, evidence collecting techniques, DNA that's known all this stuff was not known back then. They had blood typing at best, and I don't even think they had that yet. So what they would look at were things like the ballistics. Again, they didn't have the high-tech abilities we have now, but they would look at the caliber of a gun. They would look at the shell casings. So in the 50s, they could look at ballistics. Again, it wasn't as advanced as it is now. They could look at hair fibers, but again, the microscopic um, techniques weren't as advanced as they were now, as they are now. They could look at fibers. They could look at blood spatter. Again, they didn't understand DNA, so that wasn't a factor. They could look at fingerprints. That was one thing that they do. And back then, when they took samples, they would take them and they would smash them between two pieces of glass and put them under a microscope and sometimes that's how the samples samples were saved and they would do swabs and stuff and that is what happened here I believe that one of the swabs from the vaginal area was saved on a slide another great thing about this case is how the family and the town sprang into action in trying to get a reward fund started. So that was not something that you always heard about. And here's one of the ads that ran. We must not let this fiendish killer strike again. Who knows who his next victim might be, you know? And they offered money for a reward. The Great Northern Railway officials started the Kalitsky Bogle Reward Fund after the murders. And it got up to $8,000. It started at $500. But do you know what that is in 1950s money? 
It's an insane amount of money. So all these unions were also donating and when they would assemble, they would request affiliated unions to make a contribution to the reward and they would establish a place in the stores where you know people could drop in money for the reward fund. And the FBI tried to aid in the investigation, but they couldn't find, they couldn't come up with any determination about who had done it either. There were many random suspects throughout the decades. And in 1956, they tried th to use the lie detector because they had lie detectors back then to help weed out any kind of persons of interest or suspects. There was someone that Bogold had a fight with the day before. There was someone named Floyd Robertson they suspected. They even suspected Whitey Bulger of maybe doing the crime. And then later years, they considered different serial killers. One, Edward Edwards. They even tested his DNA against the bit of the remaining evidence. And his DNA did not match. But throughout the decades, they kept this case in the forefront because it was literally like one of the only unsolved cases they had at the time. They'd talk about it on the anniversaries whenever they'd talk about the areas like Wadsworth Park. This is from 1993. They'd bring it back up again. Keep it fresh in people's memories. This is from 1985. Bringing it back up again. Then they did even did some reenactments for hard copy. Here are some photo stills when they reenacted the crime in 1989 for hard copy television show. And throughout the decades, the family struggled, and it was especially hard on Patricia's family. Her father considered her to be his favorite, and the mother took on the task of talking to the police and the reporters every time they would do another story on the crime. And the father almost couldn't even talk about it. He was so shut down and traumatized by it. And her sister said, my mother and father raised this beautiful, bubbly daughter, and I can't imagine what they went through. And then after 10 years of the reward being established, since nobody was caught yet, it was decreed that any funds would go to charity. So all that money ended up going to charity which was a good thing, but it wasn't a good thing that no one was yet caught. But the police were still staying up on top of the scientific discoveries. So let's fast forward to 2001. The Montana Crime Lab looked at the evidence that they had in, on file. And in 2001, a vaginal swab, which had been preserved on a microscopic slide. Remember, I mentioned that before, how they used to put things through between glass and look under under the microscope well that was good enough to preserve the DNA and the DNA found a single sperm cell and that did not match Lloyd so knowing that it wasn't Lloyd's they enter that DNA into CODIS but CODIS did not pop back a mat a match okay so they still had an unknown right so then they, what they do is then they start working with Bode technology. Honestly, I love this stuff. And you may know that Bode technology, they research DNA, they're able to do genetic family histories. And you know that a lot of people were submitting everything to Ancestry.com and all these different places. And they were co compiling genetic databases and would say, hey, do you want to know long lost cousins and all that stuff, right? Right. Well, guess what? All, all that stuff, those markers are on a database, and they were able to pop three relative matches to that sperm cell. Yeah. So using the recovered DNA, they reverse engineered the family tree with the DNA. They found three people who were genetically compatible, and they approached those three relatives with the... um. Probably at that point, the, the idea of who they, who they knew it was, right? That person's DNA wasn't yet on file, but the other ones who were descended of that person uh, was on file. And they seemingly were open to cooperating. This is the big reveal. The DNA test of relatives showed the match to be Kenneth Gould 
who died in 2007. If you look back to see if this fellow was even in the area, of course you'd want to do that, right? I mean, nothing in the whole entire world, even if the percentages are in the billions or trillions, is perfect. You want to make sure the guy was even in the area. And sure enough, on May 25th, 1952, a Kenneth Gould, age 24, applied for a marriage license in that area. Gould, at age 29 years old, lived only one mile from the Kalitsky family, and allegedly he liked to ride horses throughout the area that her body was found. Ta-da! Investigators now believe that Gould knew Pat because she used to deliver newspapers in his neighborhood. They also say that he moved his family at a time, a wife and two kids, out of state soon after the murders. The family moved to Alton, Missouri in 1967, where he raised sheep and goats, and he was a well-respected horse trainer. Apparently, there weren't any other incidences involving him that are known. If even he did this, again, he's dead, so he didn't have his day in court. You know, everybody's innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, and he is deceased. So he didn't have a chance to say whether he had relations with her and something else happened, but I doubt it. One of his friends or neighbors went on the record and said, I can't believe this stuff about Ken. I just plain do not believe it. He'd been his neighbor for 10 years in Missouri. He said Gould and the family lived on a farm. Like I said, he was a respected horse trainer. He said that as he was an ideal neighbor, he was easygoing, he's soft-spoken, he didn't drink, he didn't raise cane, never even heard him cuss in his life, and he was just a real good man. But you don't always know the people around you folks, all right? You don't always know what they're capable of. So on, in June of 2021, last year, the gavel came down and they have case closed on what they consider to be the oldest cold case in the country to be now solved by forensic genealogy. So congrats to the people of this little city that kept this crime in the forefront and didn't forget about these precious victims. Congrats to the, the technology advancements. Congrats to Bode Technology for helping out solve this case. And let's just play it out with the victims. And I, I added the find a grave for these two. Thank you so much for watching Solve by DNA. And if you like this sort of thing, just sub up to my channel as told by Thielen. Maybe we'll do these like once a week or something. They're coming in fast and furious. DNA is solving all kinds of really old crimes. And I hope you found this interesting. I hope you found this edifying. If you did, please push the like, please push the subscribe. And without further ado, have an excellent day.